Where are you from? I am originally from Chile. Oh. Uh, yeah, I came to the States when I was about uh, my student's age, actually. Oh, about really? seven years old. And where did you move to? Um, my family moved to Norfolk, Virginia, and I lived there for a couple of years, uh -huh. and then Spain, and then back to Norfolk. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm on the East Coast now. We going? We're good okay. Just go. <laughs> warming up. Um, oh, that's neat. I live in Washington, D.C. So. I went to school in D.C. You did where? G.W. Oh. Yeah, I was there for pretty. eight years before coming here. Very good. Well, I was here 17 years before going there. Oh, we switched. <laughs> totally. Okay, so tell me, um, I think I'll go to graduate, sorry. Um, why did you decide to join the residency? Um, I, I feel like I hit a point in my life, like many 20-somethings, uh, where you don't know what to do your life, and so you start thinking grad school. And um, at the time, I was um, actually in police academy, so I was about three months away from graduating from um, Washington Metropolitan Police, and um, I majored in criminal justice. I thought that that was the career that I wanted to go into. I knew I wanted to do something where I could use my experience as an immigrant um, to serve my community somehow. And um, yeah, I, I just sort of hit a point in academy where I knew that law enforcement wasn't what I wanted to do. And I started thinking about, well, what are my passions? Well, I value, like I said, using my experience as an immigrant to, you know, to, to help my community. Um, I started thinking about how much I love <laughs> You know, I love kids. I I'd, um, had a chance to do vacation Bible school when I was a teenager. I tutored in college. And so I, it, I kind of had to go back and see what all my skills were. And um, I come from a family of teachers, so I don't know why I didn't think about teaching the first time around. So I really wanted to look for a program that would allow me to um, really see if teaching would be for me. Um, I didn't want to invest the amount of, you know, kind of time that I had invested into law enforcement only to find out that it wasn't a good fit. And um, Denver Teacher Residency made sense um, in thinking about a program that would allow me to have classroom experience and would also um, have the very the academic side. And coming away, you know, with a master's at the end of it, I think, was really, really valuable. Awesome. And did you look into any other programs? You know, did you, what made you go towards that res the residency? Well, at the time, I was trying to move to Colorado anyways in Denver. And so... Um, I know the Denver Teaching Fellows, I think, was around at the mm -hmm. time. And what really made me lean more towards Denver Teacher Residency was um, just the amount of time. I know that some of the other programs, uh, some of the other teacher prep programs are really too short. It's three months, and then they just kind of throw you in. But with um, with DTR, you're really spending a whole year um, with the in the classroom and, and, and learning, doing your college classes. And so it just felt like a kind of like a more comprehensive approach. Well, so tell me a little bit more. You talked just a little bit about your residency experience. What was that like? My residency experience was um, very positive. I was actually here at Goss Elementary, so I was in third grade, and um, I feel like I kind of got a chance to experience everything. There was a day where the music teacher was out, and I, I volunteered as tribute to, uh, to be the sub, and um, I just had so much fun being able to um, interact with all grade levels and a content area that I knew wouldn't be teaching in. But I think it was little moments like that where um, I felt like I could really learn kind of the different aspects of a school. I think that something that really made me want to stay here at Gust was feeling like I had more than one mentor teacher. Um, I'm really fortunate to be working now with my former mentor, um, Jessica Wagner. She's currently teaching third grade math, so we do a lot of work together. Um, but Jess, I just felt really invested in by the other teachers in the school. They always welcomed me into their classrooms when I had questions to observe. And so I feel like really that's kind of like the core of DTR is being able to be present in the school and um, learn what it's like to be a teacher, not just from your classes and your mentor, but really you're, you're learning from everyone. Mm -hmm. T tell me a little bit more about that. I think that's fascinating that you had one mentor, but you felt like you kind of were mentored across the school. Can yeah. you talk about, you know, the kind of work that you did with your mentor and other teachers? Sure. Um, I think that a lot of that comes from um, the fact that Gust has so many DTR um, alums. And so um, it's kind of like a funny, like a funny web, like, um, you know, 
my mentors, mentors down the hall, you know, so it's sort of that, that kind of thing. Um, but really knowing that there's so ma that many people who have had just experience and training and what it's like to coach, um, I think is so valuable. So, um, for example, when I started getting ready to plan for my spring lead, which was three whole weeks in uh, April, I, um, I found myself, you know, I would sit down and have planning time with my two mentor teachers. I had, um, a, one for literacy and one for math. And, um, I wanted to know, you know, what other teachers were doing. And so I would pop into other third grade classrooms and I was so lucky to have, um, other residents, alums, you know, across the hall. Um, so I feel like that's just, I don't know, it was just so nice to be able to, to whenever I had a question, even if my mentor teacher was observing someone else or she was outside of the building, I knew that I could pop in and, you know, they knew what I would be talking about. Even if it was a question about my practice, if it was a question about an assignment or something, I knew that I could go to them. I think that the problem of practice came up a lot in thinking about, well, you know, I'm looking at improving my academic language. I hear, the, you know, that Kate is really amazing with her class and in involving academic language and making sure that students are using that higher content vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, pop in her classroom and just, you know, observe for 10 minutes, kind of take some notes, see what systems I could pull. And so I feel that that's something that I still experience now, even as a teacher of record here, knowing, knowing where the expertise are and really I feel like DTR cultivates um, an attitude of learning and reflection. So I feel like this is the, a great place to be able to experience that. So um, did you feel prepared to enter the classroom unit? You, know, you talked about training here and then making the choice to join GUST and, mm -hmm. and become part of the staff. Did you feel prepared? I did. And I think that um, it's funny because <laughs> in May and June, when you're about to launch into your, your first year of teaching, I, I don't think maybe I felt quite prepared at that moment. I had, you know, kind of unknown landscape ahead of me. I was going from third grade to second grade teaching by myself. Um, I didn't know if I would have a para or not. So I think kind of launching into that, I felt, I felt a little nervous and unsure. And really the moment for me that kind of cemented it and made me realize, okay, DTR did, a, did what they were supposed to do in preparing me was um, when I was attending New Educators Institute, NEI, it's kind of like a like a new teacher boot camp that they hold every um, every August, and I went in and we were having this um, this mini class on content language objectives, which is really kind of where you're communicating to students what the purpose of our learning is, what are the goals you want to accomplish, and we had several classes on on CLOs. I'd been observed on them. I've they'd been kind of a, a problem of practice for me, so I'd, I'd already spent so much time thinking about this and. Um, there was a moment when there was a, a young man who was coming in um, into the district for the first time and he hadn't gone through any teacher prep program that I knew of but had just sort of majored in, in college I guess in teaching so there wasn't any I guess post postgrad program that he went to but he um, he asked like what's a what's an objective and I just sort of had this moment of oh my gosh like I know that the time that I spent in DTR was worth something because I, I know this, and it's not just, you know, this isn't just a refresher for me. It kind of, like, cemented the fact that, you know, months of toiling after <laughs> something that felt kind of like abstract, I knew that I could then put into practice only a couple weeks later because of the time and the coaching that I had received from the residents me here. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about, you know, you as a teacher now. Uh, you know, we're kind of looking back to the residency, but let's fast forward and talk to me about, you know, maybe link some of those things that you do really well in the classroom. You know, is there a link to the residency? Can you see a correlation between that prep and your current practice? Sure. I think that there are a lot of systems that I saw my uh, mentor teachers implement that I knew were best practice and I made sure to implement them. Um, so, for example, I know that in third, you know, and I mentioned this, that I'm constantly talking to my former mentor to see what she's doing in third grade, just because I want my students to be able to, to have what they need to, to, um, to go on and be successful. And part of it also is the language. I teach 
in a bilingual classroom, the district is moving towards biliteracy. And so a lot of the work that I've done this year has been helping my students learn in Spanish and English. And so one way that we can link that across grade levels and create vertical alignment is through, um, we call them um, respectful phrases. Um, I'm trying to think of what the word is in English because I'm, I'm seeing the poster in Spanish, but um, it, accountable talk. So in thinking about, you know, to say, well, I respectfully agree, I respectfully disagree. Um, I'm confused by that. What's your evidence? And so all these like funny little hand motions that help the students question each other's thinking. I know that Jessica has used them in the past and I know that she's using them in third grade now. And thinking about being able to create that alignment is something so powerful. I know that next year she's not gonna have to spend that much time teaching those systems if they're already in place. And what happens then if they're using those same systems maybe in fourth grade and fifth grade. And so really you're creating more time for content. You're helping students be able to to respectfully communicate with each other, to use academic language in, the, in a way that's consistent across grade levels. And that's something that I saw my residency year from the beginning, and I knew that that was something I wanted to implement. I think about the things that I, that my lead teachers identified as my strength, my residency year, and I find now that in my practice, those are the things that come easiest to me. So for example, behavior management. Maybe it's coming from law enforcement, but I feel like behavior management is something that um, is, is a strength for me. I know how to, and I have, I have 33 kids, and that's more than any other class in my school. So, to, we, I have to have good behavior management to be able to have, you know, that many students and and be able to teach. And I feel like my residency year, they really put a focus on no nonsense nurturing, and that was something that I definitely took with me. And so now I feel like I don't have to spend as much time in my practice like focusing on that. So it's funny to see kind of like the things that are the natural strengths that come up and then maybe there are other areas. Like for example, um, I find that academic feedback, that's an area where I'm, I, I need to grow at, which you know, essentially is not just saying, good job, you're awesome to a child, but you know, being more specific, like what it is that you're asking them to do, like how can they grow? And yeah, kind of like looking back to that, that process of being observed as a resident and hearing that feedback. I, I'm still getting observed. I'm, I'm used to having people like pop in and out of my classroom, especially now as a mentor, you know, there's always someone in there, someone visiting. And so really you develop like a transparency in your practice that I don't think I would have otherwise. So let's stay there for just a minute and talk a little bit about being a mentor in the program. So tell me, you know, you have to make your practice really transparent. So maybe talk a little bit about your role as mentor. You know, this ability that you have to articulate your practice and then to kind of coach this novice teacher to become, you know, your colleague. Yeah, it's it was kind of strange. Last year, I didn't have a resident. It was my first year as a teacher of record. I had a paraprofessional. And I found myself constantly explaining to my para why I was doing things. So, you know, I'd say, well, you know, today we're going we're gonna to do this in small groups because I'm noticing that, you know, Yesterday when I taught the lesson, I didn't differentiate, and he would just sort of shake his head and say, okay, well, what do you want me to do? And it's not really that like he was looking for those explanations, but um, yeah, I think that, that that level of transparency and self-reflection that DTR develops just kind of becomes innate. So I think that that's why you see so many mentors becoming, so many former alums becoming mentors and coaches is because we're already used to constantly looking at our practice and finding those areas of strength and those areas of growth. And um, so I think that that part of it is kind of came easy. Um, I think that there's such a huge accountability piece too in knowing that what my resident sees, those are habits, those are practices that she's going to pick up, especially in thinking about the impact that my own mentors had on me and my practice, not just the systems, but just habits of work. And so... Um, you know, there's definitely, I try to have that, that level of um, just an open dialogue with my resident and say, you know, what I just did, that wasn't best practice, let's talk about why. And so that really causes me to continue to reflect on my practice and it gives her a place where she can also question what that means. You know, maybe this particular strategy, maybe this particular lesson works for my student population at this grade level at this time, maybe it won't transfer cross content areas, maybe it won't transfer to another grade level, to another student population in another part of the district. So I think that that's kind of the best part of mentorship is being able to 
really dive into your own practice and there's that accountability piece like I I can't slack off there's always somebody watching there's always somebody there and not just that but um you know my my practice is going to affect my resident who's then going to go on to teach and maybe she'll um you know maybe she'll have a resident of her own someday I remember my um my residency you're going to visit a school and um I saw a really great strategy, and I asked the teacher, that's so cool, like, how, you know, where did you come up with it? And she said, oh my goodness, Jessica Templeton was my lead teacher. Jessica Templeton um, is a teacher here at GAS, and she was working down the hall from me. And so it was amazing to see a strategy from somebody who's working across the hall from me at another school across the city. So when I think about that, thinking about, you know, that the things that we do can imp have an impact that's so much greater than what we see, I think that that um, that makes me be a little bit more self-aware about what I'm doing and um, and mostly about how it's impacting my students as well because ultimately, you know, the resident may or may not choose to stay in the teaching profession, but, you know, these kids are going to have to go through school and, you know, I want to make sure that they're being impacted positively by my practice. So my last question, do you think that the residency is good for kids? I think it's wonderful for kids. and And I think that my experience is very biased because I've had I've had a wonderful residency experience. My, you know, my residency year was great. I my first year as a mentor, I've had I've been so lucky to have a really great resident. She just got hired today, so we're we had a mini dance party to celebrate. But um, I think about the ability, for example, to have to meet every day for guided reading groups, to have that differentiation, and to know that my resident went through the same training that I did, and so her coursework is fresh. Like I know that the things that she's learning, she can implement right away. And I think just like the amount of data that I've been able to call that I wasn't able to call last year is, is huge. She's helped me, um, for example, progress monitor in both Spanish and English. We can tell you the reading level of every student in both languages. Each kid knows where they're at. Each kid has a conference with the teacher a couple of times a week. And so just the amount of teacher time that they get is, is so valuable. Think about 33 kids, if all, I've, if all I had was a para um, who was only there for a couple of hours. I experienced that last year. And we saw growth, which is great, but just the amount of growth we've been able to see this year has been huge. Not only that, but I feel like my resident is invested in my classroom. And that, you know, and I kind of realized this today when she was asking about, well, I know towards the end of the year we have to spend some time at the school we're hired at. And then, you know, 50% of the time, so she was asking me, well, how's that going to work? Because I want to be with our students. And it just, I felt so lucky that she was so, um, so rooted in our classroom that she wanted to see it through the end. And I know that that's not everyone's experience. I've had colleagues who've haven't had great residents or who have lost residents along the way to career changes, to, you know, personalities clashing. But when the, when everything is aligned with, it's a great match. I think that the students will ultimately benefit from having two trained teachers in the classroom. And yeah, I think that as long as both, both parties are really invested in the students, you can have some really phenomenal growth. Not to mention the fact that I know, for example, that every student in my classroom, they have a strong bond with one of the teachers. And it may not be me, but it may be my resident. And that's okay. As long as there's one adult in the room that they feel that connection with, that they can have a rapport, some inside jokes with, who they can go when they need a Band-Aid, I think that that's, that's the cool thing, too, that no matter, not just academically, but I know that if a student is going through something, if they don't feel comfortable talking to me, maybe they'll feel comfortable talking to my resident. If something happens and I'm in the middle of teaching and there's a you know, a kid starts crying for no reason, which happens in second grade, you know, she can pull that child aside and figure out what's really going on as opposed to just ignoring it. And really when a child is getting so much more attention from an instructor, that can impact their learning in every area, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank that you. Was